Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'm Jen Beagle, the Director General of the International Development Law Organization, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, to this side event on a rule of law based approach to sustainable economic recovery for least developed countries. Our intent today is to highlight the special needs of LDCs in the context of the action oriented dialogue taking place in this forum and to contribute to the identification of solutions to finance both the COVID-19 economic recovery and sustainable development on the path to 2030. In this context, we are also highlighting the contribution of IDLO's investment support program for least developed countries as a public-private partnership for investment capacity development in LDCs. I should note that the session will be recorded and the video recording will be disseminated online. And I do hope that we will be able to have an interactive dialogue. For those of you who would like to ask a question or make a comment, um, please let us know via the chat feature and we will give it an opportunity uh, to as many of you as possible um, to make an intervention during the question and answer period. And now it is with great pleasure that I share with you a message from the President of the Economic and Social Council, His Excellency, Ambassador Munia Akram. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to take part in today's special event organized by the IDLO. It helps bring into our discussions the special situation of the least developed countries. If the vision of the 2030 Agenda for promoting peaceful, prosperous and inclusive societies is to become a reality, the needs of the LDCs must be prioritized. The instrumental role of foreign direct investment for the realization of the SDGs for the least developed countries is specifically recognized in target 10B, which stresses the importance to encourage foreign direct investment to the LDCs in accordance with their national plans. The quality of investments, their capacity to embrace the economic as well as the social and environmental dimensions that make for durable, truly sustainable development is as important as their quantity. This implies in turn, a level playing field in investment negotiations and the ability of recipient countries to develop and nurture a conducive legal and regulatory framework capable of attracting and sustaining investment flows. It is an effort that requires the purposeful, focused mobilization of all resources and capacities, both public and private. As president of the Economic and Social Council, I have proposed the creation of a public-private facility for sustainable infrastructure investment under the United Nations umbrella to help developing countries and the least developed countries to bridge the existing sustainable infrastructure investment gap. The proposed facility could utilize the vast network of UN resident coordinators and resident representatives to identify the possible <clears throat> infrastructure projects to help the developing countries to build the capacity to formulate good projects and feasibility and pre-feasibility studies for such projects. The facility would also be designed to find the right partners for those projects in the investment world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to have followed and supported over the past few years the development of IDLO's investment support program for the least developed countries. I regard it as a model of a concrete, ably designed program that is specific to its beneficiaries, the least developed countries, and distinctive as to its modalities of action. But at the same time, it is comprehensive 
in several different ways. First, it harnesses the contribution of both the private and public sector. Second, it assists beneficiary countries to improve their business and regulatory environment, including in such fields as contracts, commercial dispute resolution, and legal capacity development. And third, it aims to strengthen national capacity through complementary on-demand training and by drawing upon experts available in the country and the region. I wish IDLO and the program well and congratulate Director General Beagle as well as the chair of the LDC group, Ambassador Ligoya, and my dear friend Patricio Cibilli and other experts who are guiding the program through the ISP LDC's steering committee and will be participating in what I'm sure will be an enriching and stimulating dialogue in this side event. I would like to take this opportunity to request IDLO to formulate similar programs for other developing and middle-income countries as well. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Akram, for your very uh, supportive statement. We're very pleased uh, to have with us today a very exciting lineup of speakers, and all of them bring a wealth of experience and expertise on the rule of law, inclusive economic development, and investment policy, and all share a strong commitment to the cause of the least developed countries. So first, let me introduce to you the co-sponsors of this side event. The High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries and Small Island Developing States, Under Secretary General, Fakitimoala Katua Utukamanu. His Excellency, Ambassador Perks Master Clemency Lagoya, Permanent Representative of the Republic of Malawi to the United Nations and Chair of the LDC's group. First Councillor Lorenzo Marini, Head of the Sustainable Development Division at the Permanent Mission of Italy, to the United Nations. I'd like to make a few reflections uh, before I give them the floor. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic is threatening the hard-won development gains that LDCs have achieved in the last decade. The public health crisis has triggered the worst global recession in the last 90 years, leaving LDCs and their vulnerable populations to suffer dire consequences. It has widened the increasing inequalities between and within states. LDCs are struggling to find the resources needed to both address and minimize the pandemic's adverse impact and to support their sustainable development efforts. And it has uncovered the vulnerabilities ingrained in our global governance system, which leave LDCs particularly exposed to external shocks. Achieving Agenda 2030 and the Istanbul Program of Action becomes more difficult by the day. The international community must act quickly. We must provide the LDCs all the assistance they need to build back better in alignment with their national development priorities. There are of course many areas for urgent action, but I would like to focus here on one issue that is a key part of IDLO's mission. Private investment plays a fundamental role in kickstarting sustainable economic recovery. But to maximize effectiveness, efforts to attract private investment must be fully rooted in the rule of law. Grounding recovery in the rule of law means harnessing a legal framework to remove barriers preventing private investment from acting as a catalyst to development. These include corruption, lack of transparency, and lack of accountability. They include loss of government revenues due to ineffective negotiation of contracts, and exposure to costly dispute settlement procedures. And they include the weak linkage between private investment and the SDGs, which makes such investment less responsive to the social and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. All of these issues are further worsened by LDC's lack of resources and capacity to pursue their national development goals 
in a position of parity with private sector counterparts. To level the playing field, stronger competition, stronger cooperation, I'm sorry, stronger cooperation between the public and private sector is essential. It is only through cooperation that respective strengths can be leveraged to support LDC's investment capacity development. As part of these efforts, IDLO and the United Nations Office of the High Representative for Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Development Countries and Small Island Developing States jointly designed the Investment Support Program for Least Developed Countries. The program is funded by the European Union with contributions from the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development and the Government of Italy. The program provides legal and technical assistance and complementary capacity building to governments and eligible private sector entities in LDCs on investment related matters, including negotiation and dispute settlement. Such assistance is provided at no cost to beneficiaries by harnessing the services of lawyers and experts who participate on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. In the arbitration area, it has supported the defense of the government of the Gambia in an investor state arbitration. The assistance was fundamental to settle the dispute with the foreign investor re relinquishing its claims and the Gambia able to retain financial resources essential to counter the pandemic. The program is currently providing investment related support and complementary capacity building in Malawi, Liberia and Ethiopia. New entry points for assistance are also being discussed in Uganda, Mozambique and LDCs in the Pacific region. The program is a public-private partnership with two innovative features. First, the program adopts an integrated approach to LDC's investment capacity development. It always acts on two complementary fronts. It pairs technical support on a wide range of investment-related matters with responsiveness to capacity building needs tailored to the situation and demand of each country. Second, the program places the private sector front and center in investment capacity development. The participation and commitment of our roster of experts plays a critical part in the success of the program. However, the private sector is not only the provider, but also the recipient of capacity development, as the program also supports under-resourced small and medium enterprises in LDCs. And by doing so, it promotes the principles of social inclusion and economic sustainability in Agenda 2030. There is much work that remains to be done and the stakes could not be higher. IDLO stands ready to do its part, putting this program in service of LDC's sustainable economic recovery. To succeed, we will need commitment and participation from all parties in a spirit of multilateralism. I'm now very pleased to give the floor to Under Secretary General Otu Kamanu. Fikita, the design of ISP LDCs has brought together IDLO and your office, uh, and it's only the beginning of a growing cooperation between our two institutions. Our collaboration is now encompassing IDLO's contribution to the Doha conference next year and activities in support not only of LDCs, but also the landlocked developing countries, and I hope the SIDS. I'm very grateful for your leadership in our region uh, and also globally, and I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador Perks Ligoya, Chair of the LDC Group, uh, Jan Beagle, Director General of IDLO, uh, Mr. Lorenzo Morini, Head of the Sustainable Development Division, Permanent Mission of Italy to the United Nations, Excellencies, Distinguished Speakers, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen, I thank IDLO and, and Jen for organizing our meeting. And I would like to take uh, this opportunity to also warmly welcome all participants uh, to this side event. The focus of our meeting is of critical importance to so many of the least developed countries in their efforts to build inclusive and sustainable paths of development. Last December, I had the opportunity to be uh, with you at the inaugural meeting of the steering committee of the IDLO uh, investment support program for the least developed countries. Just a few uh, months later, it is good to see the program moving ahead. For now, more than 12 months, all of us have lived an ongoing uh, pandemic. 
deep and far-reaching disruptions continue across the world. The notion of vulnerability has taken on uh, many new layers, um, has taken on very tangible impacts in all of our daily lives. We face uh, a deep systemic shock. We face cascading and interlinked health, economic and climate crises. All the peoples of the LDCs are severely and disproportionately uh, affected. Available data show how foreign direct investment flows to the LDCs has been severely curtailed by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Yet so many of the LDCs are highly dependent on FDI to build their export-oriented uh, industries and develop infrastructure or for their tourism industry. Needless to say, this further adds to the multiple economic and financial woes and challenges of many LDCs. Once again, I warn uh, that we are at a juncture where hard-won progress may be lost if we do not act now. And it is with urgency that we must address the recovery from COVID-19 and what we now uh, need to do um, in less than a decade uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. A key issue is to address the lack of financing in many LDCs. Already prior to the pandemic, development finance made available to LDCs had fallen short of promises made and the LDCs fiscal space was already quite limited. LDCs more than ever need to attract foreign direct investment and get access to fresh additional resources lest we will leave them behind. What is needed are innovative solutions. Uh, uh, what must be done is to unlock the LDC's capacity to create an enabling environment to attract and retain foreign direct investment. And it is not uh, about just what we say, throwing money at a problem. It is about both the transfer of needed resources coupled with capacity uh, transfers uh, so that ultimately we safeguard li livelihoods, build resilient infrastructure, and promote activities in the man manufacturing and services sector with higher local value addition and technology content. And this, this uh, should create positive spillovers to the rest of the economy, including in terms of productivity, skills development, entrepreneurship, and employment generation. The, the, the role of uh, public-private partnerships can play in contributing to an accelerated recovery from the pandemic for the LDCs cannot be stated enough. And this is why OHR LLS is excited to be part of the investment support program for LDCs. The program must show very concretely how the international community and the private sector can work together to support the LDCs. As we are on our way, uh, to next year's fifth United Nations Conference on LDCs in January 2022 in Doha, Qatar, we should ensure that the success of the program is known to all LDCs, which will look for such assistance. We also hope to see similar initiatives and projects by public and private actors being announced in the lead up to and at the conference. The conference offers an important opportunity to advocate for and increase awareness on this and similar projects. It offers a great opportunity to focus international attention on stepping up support to the LDCs and attract the resources needed to scale up um, this and similar projects that will benefit the LDCs and ensure that they are at the core of any effort and are not left behind. No effort must be spared to leverage the conference to reach global agreement on how to overcome the impacts of COVID-19, ensure that the actual depth and breadth of challenges that the LDCs faced are well known to the international community and to regain lost momentum and opportunities the pandemic has brought about. The new 10-year program of action for the LDCs, which will be adopted by member states in Doha comes at a critical time. It also coincides with the last decade left to reach the goals of the 2030 agenda. The new program of action needs to address the financing gaps for LDCs, and we should ensure strong provisions for the role public-private uh, partnerships. Now it is up to all of us uh, to make our contribution. Once more, I thank ID, 
ELO and the government of Malawi and Italy as our partners for contributing to this effort and for co-organizing today's event. I wish you all a productive and successful meeting and look forward uh, to action inspiring contributions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we do look forward to continuing uh, to work with you and, and with you and with your office. I'm turning now to uh, Ambassador Lagoya. Ambassador Lagoya, you have been both as permanent representative uh, of Malawi and also as chair of the LDC group, uh, an unwavering supporter of the uh, investment support program um, and an invaluable source of guidance from the beginning. And uh, we are very grateful for that. And you have a lot in your background uh, that makes uh, you, I think, very interested also in this subject, uh, I, being a senior economist at the IMF and governor of the Reserve Bank of your country and being involved in many aspects of, of uh, development. So it's a great pleasure for me to give you the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Jan, and uh, uh, welcome everybody to this auspicious occasion. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you gave the opportunity to Ambassador Muni Akram uh, to, to give uh, his speech, Ambassador of Pakistan and ECOSOC President. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Madam uh, USG and High Representative Fakita, uh, Mr. Lorenzo Morini, uh, Patrizio uh, Chivili, and my good uh, friends, uh, Ambassadors, uh, Ibari of Uganda and Garstom of Tanzania. I'm glad you have joined in uh, as uh, distinguished, learned ambassadors, lawyers, <laughs> and uh, with very keen interest to the subject uh, we have today. Uh, I recognize the UN Foundation, uh, the Secretary General of the Italian Association of Arbitration, and other uh, distinguished uh, delegates you have joined uh, us. We are at a very important juncture uh, of uh, our history in the world because of the pandemic that we are going through and the consequences, I don't have to repeat, you know how this has affected our countries. As said by the USG, uh, our countries, the vulnerable countries, LDCs, have been uh, hit uh, very severely because of uh, lack of capacity uh, to adapt to, to the new normal. Uh, I think the government of Italy, the Kuwait Fund, uh, IDLO uh, and all who have contributed uh, to, to putting together uh, this uh, program. And especially, I think IDLO for bringing together uh, the, the lawyers who are offering their services pro bono, as you have said, Jan, this is very, very appreciated. Uh, by all of our country's LDCs. And um, you know, in the SDG 17.5, the uh, calls for uh, the establishment of an investment promotion regime for LDCs. Not much has been done so far uh, to, to achieve that. And as we go into the uh, LDC-5 preparation, I strongly uh, uh, appreciate the role of uh, IDLO to help us achieve, <laughs> to achieve this uh, in that we have an investment promotion regime uh, with your recommendations on how we can um, reform our uh, legal frameworks and uh, uh, all that can help us to attract uh, investment. I said we are at a very uh, particular juncture because not only of the COVID pandemic uh, and the building back that we have to do 
I, I read recently the, from uh, the IMF uh, a paper that said for low income countries, uh, we would need $250 billion uh, uh, dollars between now and 2025 to be able to build back uh, better and even more uh, to, to get back on track with the 2030 agenda. We as LDCs rely on sources from domestic revenue, uh, donor inflows, uh, and the private sector. We know the difficulties that um, uh, we've had so far with, um, with the uh, donor inflows. We appreciate, uh, and I was in a meeting yesterday where uh, we were told that there are a number of countries that have actually uh, uh, increased uh, their, uh, their donations as donor countries to, to LDCs, even though we know for other countries that are reducing the, the commitment from 0.7% of GNI to 0.5%. The, uh, percent of GNI. UNCTAD says that uh, 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 foreign direct investment will go down by up to 40% uh, uh, this year. And this is frightening us. Uh, when we have those amounts, 250 billion that we need to, to build back, and then private investment is falling. We, we, we need uh, to rethink and uh, help each other. That's why we call on the international community uh, to, to come together at this juncture to find solutions on how we, especially the poorest countries, uh, will be able to build back. The government of Italy is presiding the, the, the G20, and I'm very happy uh, with the programs that you have put together. And I'm glad that uh, you hear our voice as LDCs, and that uh, you will continue in all the meetings you have set up uh, to advocate uh, uh, in favor of uh, vulnerable countries, not only LDCs, but even the seeds and LLDCs. We have issues uh, or on date, which you are very well aware of, uh, and we are expecting a lot from your presidency uh, in the uh, rebuilding of the debt architecture and liquidity, uh, we are happy with uh, the 650 billion uh, SDR from the IMF, uh, uh, but we, we need more. Um, we, we have issues in climate financing, uh, issues of vaccines to, to reach to our poor countries, uh, and many more. I will not uh, mention all, but I'm very sure that uh, the government of Italy will be able to speak uh, on our behalf uh, to, the, to the G20. Let me not uh, waste time because there are so many speakers coming after me, but to thank you, Jan, and thank IDLO, uh, the government of Italy, Kuwait Fund, and everybody, uh, ILO, and everybody who are contributing uh, to the success of this pro distinctive uh, program we have. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I thank you, Ambassador, for uh, your statement, but also for your ongoing support uh, for this program. It's very, very much appreciated. 
Uh, I'm going to move now um, to uh, First Councillor Lorenzo Marini, representing the permanent mission of Italy to the United Nations. Uh, Italy's initial contribution was instrumental in the launch uh, of the ISP uh, program. And Italy, of course, is also the host country um, of IDLO and continues to be a source of invaluable support um, to the organization across a whole range of activities. And this year, we are very pleased to be able to contribute to some of the initiatives that Italy is pursuing uh, as chair of uh, the G20. And um, IDLO, uh, together with uh, UNDESA, um, is co-organizing with Italy um, later this month, uh, the second major conference on SDG 16, which I hope uh, you will all uh, participate in. So Mr. Moreni, uh, it's a pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Excellencies, uh, distinguished ambassador, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to be here today. And thank you very much to Ideologues for organizing this event and to invite Italy to be among the, the, the hosts of this, uh, this important meeting uh, dedicated to the IDLO's investment support program for the LDCs, an initiative that has a specific relevance in the context of the FFD forum. Um, as shown by the latest IATF Financing for Sustainable Development report, as I mentioned before, uh, the impact of the pandemic has shaken the global economy and put vulnerable countries, especially LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS, in an even more fragile economic and social situation. I would like also to, to thank Ambassador Ligoia because for his vote of confidence on the, on, the, on the capacity of Italy as president of the G20. We are very proud to be in this role and we are committed to do our best. Uh, we are sparing no efforts uh, to continue accelerating global action in support of the most vulnerable countries and in strengthening the, the multilateral and multidimensional response to the pandemic specifically through, through some initiatives that uh, are focusing on, on the access, uh, global access to vaccines uh, through the COVAX facility and the ACT accelerator, but also on, on some aspect that Ambassador Rigoyo already mentioned, uh, which, is, which are focused on the, on the fiscal space uh, on, on, uh, and expanding fiscal space, expanding the possibility for, for vulnerable countries to access to, to finance and to, to, you know, to, to receive a relief in terms of, of debt burden. Some, uh, some objectives already have been achieved, some, some important uh, targets, let's say, uh, as, such as the, the, span, the, the extension sorry, of the DSSI initiative, the G20 Paris Club uh, DSSI initiative on that, uh, the operationalization of the common framework of the, uh, on debt management, and the mission of the new SDRs, uh, as, by, as mentioned by Ambassador Rigoya, but we are, we are looking at other initiatives and I don't want to, to, to you know, to uh, now to, to, to put the, you know, to, to say what we could really be on the verge of achieving, but it's, it's you know, we, we see that there are many, many uh, positive signs that we are going to, to, to get some, some definitive and some important results in, in the next few months. Um, also, on a national basis, Italy is, is committed in continuing our support to, to the UNDS development system globally and to, with a specific focus on the most vulnerable countries. Uh, despite the dire human, economic and social costs of the pandemic that we experience also in, in our country, we are committed in confirming our role as ninth major global provider of uh, official development assistance, ODAs, uh, on a, at a global level. In this context, uh, supporting and strengthening the capacities of, of LDCs would be crucial uh, for building back better and ensuring a truly global and inclusive recovery. Uh, so Italy is proud to have supported IDLO's investment support program for the LDCs since its inception in 2017. And we are working in partnership with the, uh, the high um, the, the Office of the High Representative for LLDC, LDCs and SIDS in, uh, in synergy with the group of the LDCs also. And we are determined to, to, to confirm our support to, to this program. And uh, I, I want to mention that uh, we want, like, I would like to commend uh, in this opportunity the efforts put in place by IDLOs together with the High uh, Representative Office and, and the recipient countries in the implementation of this innovative program, despite all the, the challenges put uh, by, forward by the pandemics. Um, uh, during 2020, IDLO has, has provided a specific focus on development of e-learning tools 
to be deployed with, while travel remains restricted on the production of a set of capacity building videos suitable for wide circulation on the introduction of fundamental training concepts aimed at creating a uniform baseline participant knowledge that are elements that are fundamental to work in this new reality that we are facing and i really would like to commend your 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 activities the ideologues activities and the, the significant objectives that have been reached in this in this context it is now of the, of the most utmost importance to raise the attention of the international community on this program um, as a fundamental tool in the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, by focusing on the specific bottlenecks and challenges faced by LDCs in managing and attracting FDIs, the program provides an ideal platform to exploit the full potential of multi-stakeholders, public-private partnership at the service of the LDCs in this crucial phase. The attraction of private investment, as mentioned by uh, by you, Ms. Mrs. Bigelow, is, uh, is fundamental, is an essential backbone to recover better from the pandemic and to put the SDGs back on track on the present de decade of action. There cannot be a stable and resilient economic recovery without a rule of law based approach and with sound business environment to attract FDIs based on fair and equal public private cooperation. Everyone must play its part uh, in this equation. This is, this is something that is at the basis of IDLOS programs and it's of the most utmost importance uh, in the sense to work all together to reach uh, its ambitious uh, objectives. Uh, we are happy to see that there is an increased amount of support uh, by, for instance, the European Union and other partners, and we look forward to other partners to join us in these efforts. And we also are very happy to see that the beneficiary partners are expanding. Like uh, you mentioned, uh, Uganda, Mozambique are joining, the, uh, Ethiopia, Gambia, Malawi, and Liberia. And we are looking forward also to the Pacific region LDCs to join the program in the next future. Now, uh, allow me to highlight, highlight something that you already mentioned, uh, Mrs. Beagle, the, the fact that uh, uh, in, in May there will be the, the next, the second edition of the SDG 16 conference. It will be organized together with IDLOs and DESA in Rome, uh, 28, 30 May. I hope there will be a, a possibility for participants to, to be there. We still are facing many difficulties, so we are not certain that if it will become a hybrid meeting or if it will be carried out in a hybrid mode or in presential mode. So uh, we are still working on that, but we look forward to the participation of as much uh, members of the international community, members of the civil society, academia, private sectors, representatives as possible, because we think that it's important to keep discussing the importance of uh, SDG 16 in, the, in building resilience to shocks and in providing a roadmap for a more just, inclusive, and, and equitable recovery in this in this crucial phase. I thank you very much once again for, for your invitation to be part of this event, and I look forward to the contribution of the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Marini. And so we've, I think we've had some very good guidance from our distinguished co-sponsors. And now let's turn to our thematic uh, discussion, and our focus will be um, on the contribution of the public-private partnership to advancing investment capacity development in the LDCs, which we I think we have heard from all the speakers is, is really essential. Uh, we look at the principles and values that should guide global cooperation in support of LDCs and their investment expansion needs and rule of law based approaches that can most concretely enhance LDC's economic uh, recovery and development efforts. So taking part in our discussion today are His Excellency Ambassador Adonia uh, Ayabari, the permanent representative of Uganda to the United Nations, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kennedy Gaston, permanent representative of Tanzania to the United Nations, Ms. Cecile Bilot, uh, head of unit uh, on microeconomic analysis, investment climate, private sector, trade and employment, at the Director General for International Partnerships of the European Commission, Dr. Kabir Dugal, Senior International Arbitration Advisor at Arnold and Porter, Professor Maria Beatrice Deli, Secretary General of the Italian Association for Arbitration and Secretary General of the Italian Chapter of the International Chamber of Commerce, and Dr. Howard Mann, uh, an international investment law and arbitration expert. So I'm going to uh, begin uh, with uh, Ambassador 
uh, Ayabari, um, Ambassador, you have a very long history in supporting conflict prevention and, and resolution processes uh, on the African continent. And we know um, that the COVID-19 pandemic is much more than a public health crisis. It's had devastating social and economic impacts, and it's really put governance systems under increasing pressure and it acts as a, as a trigger for also political instability, therefore increasing the perception of risks uh, in LDCs and, and maybe uh, negatively impacting uh, investment flows. So based on your experience, how can public-private partnerships like the Investment Support Program help to lower the perception of investment risk and support LDC's efforts towards sustainable economic recovery? You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you, IDRO, uh, for organizing this important and timely event. Uh, 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 as we recover, as we plan to recover from the COVID pandemic, um, and uh, your question is really, you know, very, very important. You know, the perception of Africa as uh, an investment uh, uh, risk zone must be dealt with before we can uh, realize uh, FDI, foreign direct investment. I will just give you a quick example. Uganda has just signed uh, with Total and Tanzania the construction of the longest oil pipeline in the world. Uh, but, and that was last week. And, uh, but for years, the perception of risk hovered around this project. And, um, you know, you can't imagine, you know, if there was time, you know, it would be a case study of how perception of risk can, can really uh, be a hindrance to sustainable uh, uh, investment and development. And what this uh, uh, invest, investment support program does, it is to really help us, you know, in such a protracted negotiations as we have just gone through that oil pipeline project. And uh, as you mentioned, Uganda is on the verge of uh, signing up, and I think we should sign up. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we need this much needed expertise. You know, as a, as a lawyer, I was a government lawyer, you can't imagine how many files you handle, <laughs> negotiations and uh, cases you handle. Um, you know, we have few lawyers, but also few trained lawyers that deal with this kind of negotiations. And I think uh, this program will go a long way and I would encourage all countries to really join. We'll go a long way, not only in building capacity for our countries, but also in changing perceptions of risk. Because if you have good agreements and good um, investment agreements, you really lower, there is a direct correlation between risk and good, uh, and good investment agreements. So IDRO is really, and uh, to echo my friends, Ambassador Parks Regoya's remarks, uh, we need smart recovery, and FDI uh, is very important. ODA, you know, is important, but ODA is not sustainable, you know, like FDI. We, we need ODA, but we need FDI, more importantly, uh, uh, investment, especially smart and investment that benefits the LDCs. Uh, thank you. Thank you for now. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, and... Uh... Definitely, this need for FDI, I think, is a, is a is a theme which will run through uh, run through our meeting, and it's, it's really a pleasure now to give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Kennedy uh, Gaston to to think a little bit about the values and principles that should guide our efforts in promoting sustainable economic recovery in LDCs. Ambassador Gaston is now the ambassador uh, of his country here at the United Nations, but he's also uh, for many years been the uh, Secretary General of the uh, Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. And uh, I know that you retain uh, a very strong legal sensibility, although now you are in the, in the, the diplomatic uh, arena. Uh, so what link um, do you see between the rule of law and sustainable economic recovery? And what role do you see for uh, this investment support program in fostering this relationship further. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, thank you, co-sponsors and organizers, colleagues, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really my honor to participate in this important uh, event, a timed event, as Brother Adonia and Brother Peck have well uh, described it. 
Um, Madam Moderator, there are many things that we can say from the theoretical point of view, but the fact remains that uh, rule of law is a principle, is a governance principle. Is a principle that entails a lot of things that are necessary if we are to build an investment regime that can attract foreign direct investment. And therefore, when you look at rule of law in terms of uh, the legal predictability, in terms of the accountability to law, uh, in terms of supremacy of law, in terms of participation in decision making, you find that these are critical issues that will create a trust and the confidence in the eyes of the investors, but also in the eyes of the investment regime at a national level. And there are numerous uh, General Assembly resolutions that have confirmed that really uh, rule of law is critical for any uh, economic recovery, but also for any sustainable development. And I think uh, the program like um, investment support uh, uh, program of the idea law is timely because uh, it deals with uh, enabling the host countries in terms of their preparedness, but also in terms of their capacity to engage, to negotiate, but also to manage the so-called uh, investment. And I think this is critical. It's also important because um, it is not only in terms of really giving the pro bono lawyers who are going to defend or otherwise, but also it offers much needed training, especially to the local um, lawyers and uh, also local infrastructures. That's really necessary if we are to build investment uh, uh, promotion regime, especially for least developed countries. I wish to add that um, when we look at the investment regime, dispute settlement mechanism is one of the key, particularly within the package of really setting out um, a regime that can be trusted and so forth and so on. And quite often, um, investors do not trust local courts or I mean local um, institution, not because of ineffectiveness of those local institutions, not at all. It is purely because of the trust. When you deal with people who are coming from different cultures, different legal traditions, it takes time for them to trust the, the, the local uh, institution to deal with their, with their um, disputes. And so that's why um, uh, mechanisms like uh, alternative dispute resolutions, arbitration to mention, um, as one of the example, becomes very important. And therefore, the, uh, the fact that the program is supporting the arbitrators and uh, you know, enable them to appreciate the dynamics of it, enable them, I think this creates a mutually uh, needed trust among the investors and also the locals. Let me just at this stage finish by giving one example, again, of how important it is to deal with the dispute. Uh, just a few years ago in 2016, we had one country in Africa, which was involved in arbitration case. And I'm, I'm sure the expert arbitrators in audience will be aware of it. That country, investor in that country, in the refinery, I think oil refinery project, had invested 44 million only, 44 million. But a year later, the dispute came and the award was given against that country and the country was supposed to pay 6.6 .6 billion. That was 2017. When, the, when the, that case was filed for enforcement of the award in 2018, the interest that was attached to the principal sub of 6.6 .6 billion had accrued to 9 billion. Now just imagine 9 billion public fund just for investment of 44 million that will be paid. That the amount of money that really, when you look at it, you have to think and rethink about the kind of uh, dispute settlement mechanism that you have to put in place. Nine billion, uh, Madam Moderator, is almost the same UN budget. If you take 3.2 billion for the regular budget and maybe 6 billion for the peacekeeping operations, that's a huge amount of money. And that's why you find that many developing countries, especially in Africa, have now developed attitudes of really not supporting on one hand, for example, arbitration or other out of the court settlement mechanism. But that's because primarily, not because investors uh, have bad intentions. No, 
but because maybe there is some sort of uh, lack of agreements and uh, you know they are not on the same page so investment program like the idlo uh, which is now supported by the idlo will help in helping parties to negotiate better the agreement to be on the same page and but also to develop a way in which those disputes if any can easily be settled amicably i thank you madam Wonder. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'd like now to, to welcome uh, Madame Cecile Bilot from the newly established uh, Directorate General for International Partnerships at the European Commission. We are very grateful uh, for the European Union's uh, support for this program, as well as for your participation here today. Um, Cecile, in, in the past month, the European Union has positioned itself as the main architect and supporter of sustainable economic recovery and private sector development in the European context. So my question to you is, how do these efforts translate to the EU's external action to support private sector investment in LDCs? And how important um, do you see public-private partnerships like the uh, ISP program in achieving this objective? You have the floor. Many thanks, James, for uh, this question and for in this introduction. Uh, this has been very interesting for me to hear about uh, all the ambassador, the excellencies, and speaker talking about your program, uh, which uh, we are happy to to contribute to and to and to support from the European Commission side. It shows really uh, this this type of program, as you explain, um, and as as the different also ambassador um, witnesses, it's, it's uh, this type of partnership, which is really at the core of what the European Union wants to, um, to support. So it's very concrete. I mean, you provide concrete assistance uh, to really help do the better contract to do the dispute settlement uh, to LDC country where the capacity is, is often lacking. And this is a key to support investment. So I, I really like, uh, this kind of, of project, which is really on the ground, uh, contributing to uh, to make uh, investment easier in some way uh, for LDC and to promote investment. I like very much also a previous speaker who was talking about the trust because it, it's very important that you have the trust and to do that you need to have the right legal framework. It's important, of course, we all know that. So to respond more to your question, Jane, uh, what the EU also has been doing and, and the importance of investment and, and for LDC in particular. Yes, investment is very high. Uh, promoting investment in our partner country is very high. On, on the Commission agenda, uh, because we really know that uh, it, it has a big role to play to really build back better uh, the recovery for COVID. Already before COVID, uh, investment was very high, and that was, um, uh, for example, highlighted in, in the communication uh, on Africa that we issued in March last year, if I'm not wrong, and that was really putting the emphasis on helping the economic development and then investment as a key role there to play. And investment that is done also in a sustainable way, uh, which I know is also something your organization, IDLO, is, is cares very much for it. Um, so yes, definitely investment the core of what we do and the core of our funding. Now we are in a period um, in, in, in our, on our side, on the development part of, of the European Commission, where we are planning how we will spend our funds for the next seven years. It's called programming period. So we are exactly doing that at uh, each country level and each program that we found what would be the priority and I can tell you that um, economic development and investment is really on top combined of course with the green elements so investment that will promote also green uh, growth uh, is very important and also digital is another very important priority where we really also combine the sort of um, uh, economic dimension to also the digital means where we see also for LDCs uh, a lot of opportunities and a lot of way also to to bring support to getting access to finance, for example, or to getting also access to the institutional, I would say, structure and, and support um, for LDCs. Uh, we will have in the next now um, phase of uh, programming phase, as we call it in the EU, a new tool, which is called the EFSD Plus. And it's a, a tool which is really a fund, which is uh, really, dedicated to sustainable development, to investment, and offering also innovative uh, mechanism, blending, and guarantees. And this is going to be 
uh, 10 times uh, as big as what we had uh, before in, in now in this current programming period. So it will be considerably scaled up. And under this, of course, we want to uh, have a focus on LDC. Uh, we, we know it's the most um, fragile country. It's where we need also as a public administration to put most of our efforts. Sometimes it's where it's more difficult. So sometimes we have to try um, to try some innovative solution in, I would say, country which are uh, a bit more developed and not the, 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 the LDCs to see if it works and so on. And then we can replicate in, in, in LDC and fragile country. But definitely it is the, the it is the emphasis of our approach to really help what, uh, where, where it's more fragile and where it needs more support. Uh, this we have uh, as regards especially trade, aid for trade, we have um, a spe specific threshold or target of, of at least, uh, we spend 25% of everything that is in relation to promoting trade, uh, which here we're talking about investment, but of course the two, the two are very much related and it should be 25% and we are about at this target where we, um, where we have funds also supporting aid for trade. We are also having a lot of emphasis and we continue to have on um, funding uh, business um, environment and investment climate reforms, because this is key. Uh, I mean, to the risk also uh, the sort of uh, the possibility for investor to go to a country. Uh, we, we need to partner together uh, with a partner country on um, addressing the, 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 the barriers or, or the problems that are perceived by sometimes it's perceptions, also by investors. Sometimes it's more fundamental problems, but we need to discuss that. And the best way to do that is really uh, as, as some, according to what you are saying also as IADELO function, it's, it's by public private um, platform because we discuss together with private actor and the public of what are the main problems and what can we do together to address them. So we have um, uh, quite a lot of program and a lot of emphasis on developing this public uh, public uh, Public private platform, thank you, and to develop in partnership uh, with with others uh, to to um, to get this investment climate uh, better. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, a lot of work that we we have been starting to do and will continue to do even more now. Um, and I think overall um, uh, the key word also there uh, I, I want to say is on our side, trust, uh, I like very much what you say, building trust also for investors, for the climate and so on, and is doing it also in a partnership uh, approach together with all the relevant approach. So this project is in a sense a very, a very good um, a sort of uh, showcase of, of how the EU would also want to uh, provide support. So thanks for uh, for this opportunity uh, to explain a bit that thing. Thank you very much, uh, Cecile, and thank you also for, for the ongoing support. It's extremely uh, important to us and I, I, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, want to, to turn now to how we can really in practice support LDCs um, in their sustainable economic recovery efforts. And it's a pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Uh, Kabir Dugal, uh, who has really a wealth of experience in investment capacity development in support of LDCs. And uh, Kabir has also acted as a pro bono expert uh, in support of IDLO and the uh, program. And I, uh, I think it's, it's safe to say, uh, Kabir, that the pandemic has given rise to a wide range of, of issues, uh, particularly in relation to the management and retention uh, of private investment. And um, this, of course, will put the resources in LDCs under uh, increasing pressure. So in your opinion, what are the main hurdles that LDCs will have to face in addressing investment related issues of a legal nature? And how can this program help to address them? You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Delighted to be here. And I'm sure I say this on behalf of everybody. We would all rather be together in person uh, to talk about these important issues, but also because IDLO puts together very delightful spreads. I remember two years ago, we all enjoyed falafel sandwiches. So <laughs> hopefully next year we can all meet together in person. Uh, you, you've asked a very important question. And let me just start off by reflecting something Ambassador Castron spoke about, because I think he sort of really touched upon the crux of the issue, 
when he said, you know, when we're thinking of FTI and FTI in, in developing countries and LDCs in particular, we're often thinking about dispute resolution. So I thought it's a good idea perhaps to spend a few minutes talking about this dispute resolution. And this dispute resolution takes place through investment arbitration. These are very often treaties, bilateral or multilateral, signed by states. A lot of such treaties exist with LDCs. We have about 3,000 of them, and we have a lot of signatories involving LDCs. These treaties are generally broadly worded. They contain loose obligations and can give rise to very serious obligations. I think Ambassador Gastron highlighted the example of the $9 billion award. We're not talking about chump change, right? That is enough to bankrupt a lot of countries, right? Uh, just to give another example, this is a Central European country. And a few years ago, they did a total of the amount of disputes that a Central European country had. And the amount of disputes was equal to the Ministry of Health's annual budget, right? So foreign investment versus giving your people health, kind of a tough position to be in. The other point just to emphasize here is that tribunals give very limited deference to matters like national emergencies. And that's just something we want to think about. Why is it important? now for us to be talking about this because government measures can give rise to investment arbitration cases and that is what COVID has done right governments have adopted measures impacting health governments have impacted all kinds of measures lockdowns you know there's a variety of impositions and who can come in and who can go out and governments are reserving areas, right? We're going to reserve certain industries. All of these could potentially give rise to investment disputes, right? The state may ultimately win. I just want to put this out there, but the cost of the dispute itself can be so prohibitively expensive that for countries, really, the question becomes, is it worth this? Just to highlight one point, you know, we are seeing a decline in FDI, and we've seen this for some time now. Right? Let's keep this perspective in the back of our mind because, you know, this becomes the moments when governments want to attract FDI, and sometimes you may take decisions that can come back in the future in the form of investment disputes. I know Dr. Mann is going to speak about this, so I'll not. I just wanted to give a preview for what's coming. Okay, is this a real threat? The answer is yes. We're seeing this happening. Peru wanted people to go home, so it decided not to charge toll booth tolls. The toll booth companies have threatened to bring cases. We're directly seeing a COVID action giving rise to a threatened uh, claim. Mexico is facing a claim, right? Mexico, because of the pandemic, put restrictions on renewable energy production. And Mexico is facing claims. Now, I'm just giving these as two illustrations because these are in the public domain. We're seeing threatened cases. Right now, most governments are putting companies and putting businesses on lifelines, right? That is, you know, money being put in, bailout money being put in, you're getting some aid, some. We're not seeing the full impetus yet, but that doesn't mean that you are not going to see it in the future. Ambassador Gastron's horror prediction might very well come true. These might give rise to billion dollar disputes. I'm going to end here. What should you do? For existing treaties, make sure you follow your procedures in domestic law. Make sure if you are adopting decisions that you're clearly recording decisions and apply measures equally. What should you do for the future? Do these treaties with much more care and caution. 
make sure they reflect what you want them to reflect. You can forget everything I have said. Just remember this last words of Uncle Kabir saying, make use of the IDLO's investment support program. This program is intended to prevent existing and future disputes from coming up. It is a free program. You're going to get the best and the brightest minds from all over the world working together in a collaborative manner to help you. Madam moderator's phone should not stop ringing with requests for assistance because that is what this program is intended to do. With that plug, I will stop here to hear my remaining colleagues speaking, but I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kabir. And I hope my phone will, will uh, not stop ringing with both the requests for assistance, but also with uh, offers of support uh, for, this, uh, for this program. So I'm now turning to uh, Professor Maria Beatrice Delli, Secretary General of the Italian Association for Arbitration and Secretary General of the Italian Chapter of the International Chamber of Commerce. And I think today the discussion has, has clearly highlighted the importance of investment capacity development to support LDC's recovery efforts and the key role that the private sector can play as a catalyst for economic recovery. So um, from your perspective, what role do you envision for international institutions that represent and support uh, the private sector, such as the International Chamber of Commerce, in supporting investment capacity development in LDCs? And do you see um, synergies between the support that private sector organizations like the ICC can provide to businesses and the assistance available under a program like ISP? And, and how could we achieve a catalytic effect between the two? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and good evening and good afternoon to the distinguished audience. It's a great pleasure and an honor for me to, to be here, take part of the meeting. Let me first thank, of course, IDLO, their excellences, distinguished ambassadors and high-level representatives and esteemed colleagues and friends. I'm very honored and pleased to be part of today's panel. And the question you addressed me is particularly important because I uh, in, uh, in uh, the perspective of ICC, um, public-private partnership is a prominent lever today more than ever. And in times of rapidly shifting politics, impacting everything from trade to climate change, ICC strongly believes that the global agenda could benefit from greater engagement and global engagement with the institutional and non-institutional stakeholders. And, in order to answer your question, I, I thought it would be important to present some of the paths that ICC is developing to make uh, business work in the 20s through the public-private partnership. And so I will start from uh, a first initiative, which is the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. And uh, ICC is one of the three organizations forming part of the Global Alliance which is an innovative PPP for trade-led growth and development and regularly works um, with business, governments, institutional institutions like the, the World Custom Organization to advance the global customs and trade facilitation agenda. Um, during last year, the Alliance launched four new projects in three countries, Madagascar, Nigeria, and Senegal, and introduced a technological solution to, to many of the trade's most intractable barriers. And so now the Alliance is working with several countries uh, seeking to adopt electronic phytosanitary certificate in order to comply with health standards. Another initiative, uh, which I think would be a very important, especially because it, uh, it, it is related to SMEs in Africa is the um, is a group uh, partnership where ICC is with UPS, Trade Lot Center, and West Blue Consulting, and the partnership is uh, mainly focused to help uh, women-led SMEs expand their operations to new marketplaces in Africa and around the world. 
So the partners will uh, collaborate with interest groups uh, and trade associations and other stakeholders in the region to support uh, the SMEs and entrepreneurs in the region. So in a, in a very different sectors. Um, another interesting another interesting initiative which is uh, um, supported by ICC is the Center of Entrepreneurship, uh, which is a pioneer initiative to prepare and mobilize the next generation of uh, entrepreneurs around the world. And um, the ICC has identified two hubs. Um, in order to pursue partnership with business uh, chambers of commerce, technology partners to advance local economic de development and deliver the UN SDGs. Uh, the launch was followed later by uh, the launch of a second hub in, uh, this was in, uh, in Beirut. But the, um, I mean, the, the, the core activities of the center have asked a series of talks for entrepreneurs, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, and the idea is to focus on the structural challenges facing developing market, markets. So this includes also other issues like gender inclusion, in youth employment, and other um, educational opportunities. So now the idea is that the center will be the home for uh, to a community of innovative professionals keen on challenging conventions and transforming the future of business. Uh, then more on, um, on a local basis, um, ICC joined forces with uh, some ministries and uh, one is the, uh, the Ministry of Business Development of Ghana, the UNDP and the Business for Peace Foundation and the um, to launch the Four Better Business Together program uh, operating as a focal point for different initiatives in, in Ghana. So the partners are working together to support economic recovery and, and strengthen uh, sustainability and resilience of business for the future. So um, this was just to give an idea of what uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, how much ICC is uh, um, focusing on uh, public-private partnerships. So uh, of course, the idea is that we will, uh, the private sector is, I mean, represented by ICC and by the companies which are members of the ICC as a of course, a vital role in uh, to play uh, working with national governments to foster invest investments in different sectors. So uh, thinking of the energy sector, telecommunication, digital uh, construction, all these areas could be kept together in order to, um, you know, to also to supply the, the chain in a in an open towards an open and safer market access. So uh, the idea is that uh, uh, I cannot mention uh, I cannot avoid mentioning the the capacity and the um, how much ICC uh, is focused on the dispute resolution mechanism, which is also I mean uh, we we are all. Uh, sharing uh, certain expertise uh, um, which is driven by the, the by the um, arbitration system led by uh, by ICC but uh, what I, I I want to stress is the the role in fostering the public private partnership and uh, I think there is also an interesting um, initiative which took place in uh, here in Rome where I'm staying now because we uh, ICC has uh, mm, favored um, the, the a very important cooperation with the three UN agencies based in Rome so there the I mean the the, se the economic sector involved is food, as you may imagine, the FAO and uh, WFP and uh, IFID. But ICC um, started from uh, um, a cooperation agreement with the UN agencies in order to strengthen the role of the uh, PPP. So I think it's uh, this is extremely important. So we have a an opportunity also, also due to the pandemic, to reimagine and rebuild 
systems and economies that benefit all people. And that's the, the purpose of the project uh, we, we are sharing. So it's time to build back and better. So thank you for your attention. And I do look further to having further chances to cooperate. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dali. Uh, and last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to give the floor to, to Howard Mann. I mean, Howard, you've engaged on sustainable development aspects of international economic law uh, and policy for the past 30 years. And, um, and I know that you are very clear that what we need to pursue is not just economic recovery, but sustainable economic recovery. And the book that you co-authored recently on environmental social and economic development provisions of uh, investment contracts, I think is very relevant to what we are discussing today. So my question to you is, how can we achieve sustainable economic recovery? And how can the ISP program ensure that private investment promotion and retention efforts are aligned more closely with the SDGs and uh, the whole Agenda 2030? Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... Director General, and, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this session. It's a great honor to be here with such esteemed guests and colleagues. Um, I'm going to start answering your question by saying what we can't do, in my view. Um, and, and to understand what we can't do, we need to understand what the reality is. FDI flows to least developed countries have been falling for at least five years. This is not an issue related to the pandemic. The pandemic has dropped the flows off a cliff for sure. I understand that. It's had a huge impact. But the decline in flows to least developed countries, sorry about that. Um, the decline in flows to least developed countries and low income de uh, developing countries has been going on for over five years. So there's a much broader systemic issue at play here and a much broader implication for developing countries. The notion that we're gonna somehow turn this decline, that this huge decline around and least developed countries are gonna be able to rely on flows of FDI as the primary source for internal sustainable development it's just not happening and it hasn't been happening for a while. And so I think we need to look at how, at a, as a broader economic strategy, how do we help least developed countries develop economic strategies, sustainable development strategies that are not as reliant on FDI. That's not the same thing as the financing flows. There's, we're going to need to figure out how to do financing. And I listened to the, uh, uh, the statement of the European Commission, um, Ms. Below, with, with some interest and, and the recognition of the need to focus primarily on LDCs in terms of aid. And I think that's right. But the notion of FDI-driven growth, FDI-driven sustainable development, this has not been happening for at least five years, and it's not going to happen for the next five years. That funding is dropped off a cliff and it's got an anchor on it. And I think we just need to recognize that to be honest about it. Um, if, if we're really gonna provide solutions for uh, the millions, hundreds of millions of people who, who are citizens of those countries and need the support to, to, to develop. Um, the second thing we can't do, um, or, or shouldn't do in my view, is support the idea of chasing investment at all cost, chasing foreign investment at all cost. Uh, we have tried solutions that focus on what I'll call the old rule of law model to, to, to come to the title of the, of the session. Solutions that have very extreme risk allocation provisions uh, on governments and virtually no risk on foreign investors provisions on uh, immediate rights of arbitration with limited access to dispute resolution provisions before those kick in, the loss of re recourse to domestic courts for disputes in favor of international arbitration, uh, the use of tax incentives 
and both fiscal and non-fiscal stabilization provisions, which simply have not worked in terms of attracting development to LDCs, despite 20 years of trying those tools. Uh, and, and so when we talk about the rule of law, I think we need to, to distinguish that kind of old approach and, and the international investment treaties were part of that uh, approach and see what does it mean, what, what would a new rule of law approach look like and a major part of that, in my view, has to be how we integrate the sustainable development dimensions of any investment, of all investment, uh, into the economic plan and, and social development plans of the host state. And how do we empower government to be able to generate the quality of investment that they need in order to ensure that the investment they do attract actually contributes to the sustainable development, economic development, social development, and preventing environmental harm in the host country. And that's what we wrote the book about. That book was for the Commonwealth Secretariat. And, and if you don't mind, I'll put a link to it when we're done so everyone can access it. Um, but I think we really need to to focus on how we integrate those solutions into the domestic law in developing countries, including least developing countries, and into the contract instruments. All of that is doable. It has been done, but it is not being done on a widespread basis, and it is not always being done in a purposeful basis. Uh, when we talk about climate change, for example, I have yet to see one mining contract that, that seriously takes into account the impacts of climate change for um, ensuring the resilience of the mining facility to major weather events. Yet those are perfectly foreseeable today. That's just one example at a very uh, top level. Um, and I think as part of that, and this comes to the question of what role for private, for the, the private sector, especially the law firms here, um, this is not the first time where we've seen major uh, efforts by international organizations to have the private sector support investment negotiations with developing countries. And we need to learn from some of the previous examples. And I'm going to pick on one for a country that isn't here and isn't even in LDC, and that's Argentina. Uh, in the 1990s, early 90s, Argentina had a huge financial crisis, which caused the economy to essentially collapse. The World Bank helped support Argentina with austerity measures and a requirement to privatize infrastructure. The bank supported that by hiring private sector law firms to represent Argentina in those privatization negotiations. Ten years later, when the next financial crisis hit, Argentina got hit with over 60 arbitrations against it, over 60. And one of the major reasons was because none of those contracts that were negotiated 10 years before protected the government, protected the country. They were negotiated by people who had experience representing industry, but not representing government, not representing countries, and they did not do the job of representing, of protecting governments. Um, and when we take that experience and combine it with the need to broaden agreements from transactions to those sustainable development dimensions, there's a real need to make sure that the expertise is broad-based, integrated, and so on. So I think it's not just a question of a role for private law firms. It's going to be private law firms with expertise in sustainable development, economic development, social development, and so on. And then we can actually put a package together that will really support uh, LDCs. I'm, I think I took too long, but I'll stop here. No. Thank you very much. No, certainly our, uh, our approach is, is quite different. And I think that uh, what, we are, what we are looking for is exactly what everyone ha has, has said to build the trust. Uh, among all the stakeholders. I'm going to open the floor now. We don't have very, very long, but um, we do have um, some people who have asked to take the floor. And so I'm just going to take uh, maybe two of them and then um, give the floor back 
um, to any of the panelists who might like uh, to uh, to respond. Um, the first uh, speaker is uh, James Zahn, uh, Director of Investment and Enterprise at UNCTAD. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, just to escape the formalities. Um, I wish um, I missed your question, by the way, because I was in transition to, to move into the, the panel. Um, may I have your questions, please? I didn't have a question. I understood that you had a question for the panel. Okay, thank you for, um, well, I thought I was asked to, uh, to, to comment on what has been said. Oh, okay. no, a comment or a question, of course. Okay, you have a comment, thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah. I think, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Yambigo, uh, for the opportunity. I think um, I wish to focus on this uh, promoting investment in SDGs, not what Harvard talked about uh, FDI in general. Um, in, in 2014, on the eve of, uh, of adoption of SDGs, UNCTAD came up with this assessment of 2.5 trillion US dollars annually for developing countries as a gap. And, um, and in fact, between, uh, between 2000, uh, 2015 and 2019, progress was made in the increasing investment in six out of 10 SDG um, uh, sector groupings of the sectors that we see uh, the progress in investment in that. But putting them together is far from sufficient to fill the gap of 2.5 trillion. Um, but unfortunately, um, the, the pandemic has more than undone the progress made over the past years in, uh, in, in investment in SDGs. And what we have seen, in fact, the pandemic as uh, due to the pandemic, um, FD, uh, investment in newly announced greenfield investment shrank by 33%. This is where I'm talking about SDG sectors. And then that's of, um, and that also uh, shrank in international project finance, uh, which is more, uh, more uh, most, uh, most of the projects are basically in infrastructure and in energy sector. And that's shrank by uh, 37%. So this is a kind of serious um, uh, situation we, 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 have, uh, we have been in, uh, experiencing. And the decline in LDCs, is of particular concern. And this investment in the SDG sectors, I'm talking about international uh, investment, uh, including project finance, that for uh, LDCs, um, it was 31% fewer invest, uh, greenfield project announcements in LDC sectors, um, uh, in SDGs, in LDCs. And a number of project finance deal, uh, deals also decreased, and that was kind of by 23%. So that's, that's the kind of um, situation we are in at the moment. But having said that, the, the sustainability themed investment funds, bonds increased during the pandemic. And that we see that the trillions of dollars, uh, in a sense that um, trillions of dollars are available According to our calculation, in fact, uh, by now, the investment in the sustainable development sectors is available about 1.4 to 1.5 trillion US dollars. I'm talking about um, uh, a kind of um, um, two, uh, 260 billion US dollars of green bonds um, and uh, 55 billion US dollars of social bonds, including Bonds um, that respond uh, to the, the pandemic, and there's also kind of 900 billion U.S. dollars of sustainable themed equity funds. But these funds are not moving across the equator. That's the problem. Has been mainly in developed countries, um, and including impact investment. So challenges to to move uh, these funds, channeling them into the LDCs and generate impact. What can we do at this moment? We see at the policy front, we have done kind of survey of 100 uh, of 30 countries, their SDG investment plans. And the majority of them do not have an investment promotion um, 
measures and strategies in embedded in SDG plans, in particular in LDC, is lacking of that. And well, we also review the LDC's investment promotion strategies and regulatory, from, regulatory framework. And we see very few countries have a kind of SDG as a kind of orientation in investment promotion and facilitation in their regulatory framework for investment. So this is, there's a need for double embedding. That's what we need to do as an international community. And, and secondly, there's a lack of capacity for building pipeline bankroll projects for LDCs that to attract impact investment and sustainable themed funds. I'm not talking about FDI in general. I'm talking about these funds are supposed to do good and supposed to, 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 um, to have impact on sustainable development. It is not yet. So there are a lot of things that can be done. Anktar has a compact on that. I don't want to- Yeah, thank you so that. much. I, I appreciate very much uh, you. your comments. I think they've, they've added to the, to the overall session. I, I'll take just one more. Uh, one more from uh, our audience, uh, Francesco Salerno, uh, who is a counsel at Legons Avocati uh, Associati. Uh, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, good evening and good afternoon, you distinguished speakers. Um, I would like to, first of all, thank you IDL Ho for uh, letting me participate in the program as expert in a new project that is starting with the government of Ethiopia. That said, I, I have a question um, for, for, for the panel. Um, does this program provide for one-shot support for the health disease participating, or is there a possibility to establish a more routinely cooperation between, between the health disease officials and the experts so that the, the officials can continue benefiting from the expert support and continue to develop the competencies acquired even beyond the IDLO program umbrella? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, the, for that question and also for um, going to be one of, one of our experts, which is, uh, which is really encouraging. Uh, maybe I should answer that, that question because this is really towards, uh, towards IDLO and it really talks, I think, to the whole point of the long-term sustainability of investment capacity uh, development. And uh, as, as we see it, um, this is something that is absolutely key and we must develop partnerships between public and, and private sector. And really the only way we can do that is to, is to foster uh, more trust, as has been said by, by almost all the participants in the panel, uh, between our beneficiaries and the experts um, who come in through this program. And we have seen already some instances where after the completion of the, the task, if you like, that the expert was, uh, was put on, where beneficiaries could reach out, you know, on an informal basis to the experts to, to exchange opinions or to, to get further advice. And, and we could see that evolving into a kind of mentorship um, relationship. And I think that this is just one way, of course, of, of thinking about longer term um, cap, uh, capacity development sustainability. IDLO has developed a, a training of, of trainers methodology, uh, and, and there, there are a lot of different elements to this, but definitely um, what we are looking for is not just uh, one shot, uh, as you put it, but really to, to think about longer term capacity development building. Uh, we are at the end of our time, but I did want to just give the high representative um, and uh, the ambassadors just one uh, minute uh, to, to say if they have any concluding thoughts after having listened uh, to the panel. So I, I'd like to start uh, Fikita with you. Thank you uh, uh, very much, um, Jen. And I, I, you know, I, I just uh, want to uh, appreciate uh, the uh, the views and and uh, and the points uh, raised uh, by the uh, various uh, panelists. Uh, you know, supporting uh, the uh, the program, but but uh, you know, also uh, giving uh, some uh, some thought. Um, into you know what um, 
what really could um, support, uh, make the program really effective uh, and sustainable um, in, the, in the actual, in the LDCs um, as well. Uh, and so I, I think, um, you know, there, there were a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of good um, ideas and, and proposals uh, put forward. Uh, which uh, which uh, you know we can all reflect on, um, you know, to ensure uh, the uh, the uh, effective and, and sustainable uh, operation of, of, of the program uh, and its effectiveness in the in the LDC countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think Ambassador Logoya uh, has had to leave, so I'm going to turn to uh, Ambassador Ayabare. I don't know, perhaps he also had to leave. So let me move to Ambassador Gaston. Moderator, uh, thank you very much. I think I can only emphasize really what I've been saying that uh, the investment support program of IDLO is important and I think we need to support it. And I, would, and I would, yeah, good, yeah. I would encourage uh, member states, especially developing countries to be receptive to this because it's very yeah. important. I have Google uh, has pointed out we have 3,000 BIT signed. We can confirm that a good number of them were simply photo up agreements, especially to please the visiting heads of state. They were not negotiated. And now with COVID-19, it is a recipe for disasters. So they must be careful on how they are going to be given interpretation of this. But equally important, I just want to emphasize what uh, Dr. Howard Mans pointed out. Let's not focus on FDIs. Let's focus on mobilizing local resources, create economy that is internally strong, of course externally linked, but not dominated by the FDIs. It's not working. We have seen them, the figure, the data for the past 20 years, they have tried, it hasn't worked. For the past five years, with or without COVID, there is decline in terms of FDIs going to developing countries. I thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you so much. I see Ambassador Lagoya has returned. Are you there, Ambassador? I'm not sure. I think maybe he... He will return, but probably maybe he has to leave. I know the meeting will soon be starting again. I know he's here. I am here. there. I am oh, there. Great. Let me give you a word, please. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for participating in, in this. Uh, we have heard the expert uh, messages that much as we want to get FDI, we should also uh, try as much as possible to use uh, domestic resources. My last word is to invite uh, everybody uh, to join in the preparation of LDC5 conference. We have to come up with a, a, a document that will take us to the realization of our dream, the 2030 agenda. This will be a 10 year program uh, that coincides with the end of the 2030 agenda. So we will have no excuse whatsoever, and we need your expertise, IDLO, European Union, and everybody uh, to join in. I thank you so much. Uh, I, I would like to thank everyone, everyone on the panel, and those of you who have been um, listening. I'm sorry I wasn't able to take the, the more questions that were coming uh, from the audience. I, I really feel that the discussion today has has very much um, resonated with the themes that have been coming out of, of the overall forum. I, I saw the Secretary General in his opening statement um, talking very much about the need for dialogue with all stakeholders to build trust and transparency. And I think that is what has been emphasized here today. And he talked also about an inclusive approach um, in encompassing the private sector and, and tackling longstanding weaknesses and gaps that have been obviously exposed even more um, by the pandemic. But also he talked about investing in people and the new social contract and uh, all the linkages also that were mentioned by some of the other the other panelists, the, the, the linkages with innovation, with green growth, with digitization, um, and 
particularly, I think, um, the issue of uh, perceptions, perceptions of risk and building confidence is something that has come out clearly. Um, we very much look forward to continuing to work with all of you. We look forward to um, helping um, in the preparation of the Doha uh, conference. I would just uh, recall that um, our um, SDG 16 conference that we are organizing together with you and DESA and um, the government of Italy is um, from the 28th to the 30th of April. So it's actually this month. And uh, we hope that all of you um, will register. Registration is, is open. And again, um, it is really to, to look towards the most um, equitable and sustainable uh, recovery with a focus on the most vulnerable. So I want to thank everyone. Um, as Kabir said, I do hope that next time we will be able to meet in person. Um, but meanwhile, please uh, stay safe and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, this very important work together. Thank you so much and bye-bye.